how then do we end up uh, with the Gulf War I and uh, the brutal sanctions which are posed on Iraq afterwards? So we got a naughty GCC state doing something they shouldn't have been doing. So in the aftermath of the, war, the Iran-Iraq war, it's 1989, Iran and Iraq both go to the OPEC states and say, look, we're dying over here. We need to get back on our feet. Is there any way you can help us out? And the the answer was, and Saudi Arabia was at the, at the center of this, um, what we'll do is every OPEC state will cut their production and then Iran and Iraq can increase their production by that amount so that the supply of oil in the marketplace stays the same so the price doesn't change. But it gives Iran and Iraq a larger share of the oil market. That way they can use that extra revenue to, to repair and recover from the Iran and Iraq war. So everybody's happy. Kuwait began flooding the marketplace with oil, which caused the price of oil to plunge which meant that any break that Iran and Iraq had gotten from their increased sales was, was evaporated. Um, Saddam Hussein accused Kuwait of doing this. He brought in a UN team to examine this. And the UN team discovered that what Kuwait was doing was literally stealing Iraqi oil by both, there were oil fields on the border. They were, they were pumping oil at an excessive amount on those oil fields, and they were slant drilling into Iraqi fields that were entirely on the Iraqi side of the border, and then flooding the market with Iraq stolen oil, causing the price to collapse. Saddam Hussein brought in April Glaspie, the US ambassador to Iraq, and said, I, I've tried everything, the UN, I brought the UN in, the Kuwaitis won't stop doing this, I'm gonna attack. And, and he basically told her, look, we have a historical claim to Iraq, to Kuwait. Kuwait was carved out of the Basra province of the Ottoman Empire, and we want to attack it and annex it. And she said, what happens between Arab states is of no concern to the United States. And so he interpreted that as a green light. He attacks. George Bush Sr. initially says, I don't see any issue with this at this moment, but I'm going to consult my team. He flies to Aspen, Margaret Thatcher flies to Aspen. They come out of the Aspen meeting and George Bush Sr. goes, he's a Hitler, he's a Hitler, thousand points of light. And the next thing you know, uh, we're doing Operation Desert Shield. And then the next thing you know, we're doing Operation Desert Storm. So to be clear, invading Kuwait is wrong. That's not the answer. I don't wanna sound like I'm a apologist for Saddam Hussein. But on the flip side of it, blowing Iraq up and, and smashing all its bridges, blowing up its schools, tearing up its government buildings and wrecking the place probably also isn't the answer in the other direction. So, you know, this this problem that we have in our world is a wrong is committed and then the response to fix the wrong is to do another wrong. That doesn't make the world a better place. It, Kuwait could have easily been liberated from Iraq without blowing Iraq up. It, there was no need to, to to do the kind of destruction that was done. I mean, we're, we're talking about an international force. The Egyptian army is there. The, the, the Syrians sent troops. The Saudis are there. The French are there. The British are there. The Americans are there. Like there's nothing in the world that could have prevent, that Saddam Hussein could have done to prevent the, the military capture of Kuwait. The bombing campaign that the United States unleashes on Iraq for one month, they, we bombed the hell out of the country, has no reasonable explanation other than we just wanted to test weapon systems and kill as many people as we could. And I think the result was to kind of shock and horrify the world. Like, what was that for? This was so excessive. In any case, uh, that's what we do. The second war is even more irrational. Like, at least in the case of the first war, you can say, well, we were liberating Kuwait. In the case of the second war, there is no explanation for it. So. In the aftermath of the first war, the United States announced, George Bush Sr. announced, that as soon as Iraq got, get, got rid of its weapons of mass destruction, it would be let back into the, the community of countries, right? The, the Iraqis misunder, misunderstood what was being said. They misinterpreted. They took their, their chemical weapons out into the desert in multiple sites and blew them up. They did this in August of 1991. So the war had ended, you know, like six months earlier, the Iraqis go out in the desert, they blow up all these chemical warheads and they think they're done. And then the UN weapons inspection regime shows up. First of all, chemical weapons aren't a weapon of mass destruction. They're a terror weapon. 
the number of people killed by them is actually shockingly low. It's just a horrific, horrible death that's scary. Weapons of mass destruction are nukes and biological weapons. Um, also, you can use conventional weapons as a weapon of mass destruction. You know, we killed 20,000 people when we firebombed the city of Dresden in World War II. I think burning 20,000 people alive it constitutes a weapon of mass destruction at that point, right? Obviously, we killed a lot more people when we nuked Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but you can even turn a conventional weapon into a weapon of mass destruction. In any case, we'll use the terminology because that's the terminology everybody uses, even though it's wrong, and I just want to be clear that it's wrong. The UN weapons inspection team shows up and they're like, where are the warheads? And Iraq goes, we, we don't have any. And they whip out the receipts. Who delivered those VX, sarin gas, mustard gas, warheads, nerve gas warheads to the Iraqis. It was the United States during the Iran-Iraq war. So they had the serial numbers for every single rocket. We just handed over the receipts. So the UN weapons inspection team says, okay, we have to find the serial numbers. And the Iraqis go, you're kidding. We blew that stuff up. And the weapons team goes, show us where you blew it up. We're gonna sift the sand to find the little metal serial numbers so we can check them off. By 1998, Scott Ritter, a US Marine, who was the guy leading the, the inspection team at that point, had confirmed that he found 98% of the serial numbers. The life expectancy of those weapons were expired, they were past their expiration date, but Bill Clinton was in the middle of the Monica Lewinsky scandal. He needed to distract the American public, so he ordered the UN weapons inspection team out so he could bomb Iraq. He does it, and then Saddam Hussein goes, that's it. I We were clean. You knew we were clean. You're playing dirty. I'm not letting the weapons inspection team back in. In 2002, George Bush Jr. threatens to go to war. Saddam Hussein lets the weapons inspection team back in because he doesn't want to get bombed. He gets bombed anyway, and we go to war a second round for weapons we knew they never had because Scott Ritter had identified 98%. You got to figure when you're blowing up warheads, some of those serial numbers are going to melt or be shredded. 98% shocks me. I can't believe they found 98%. You know, at that point, I would have treated that as a clean bill of health, but obviously Bill Clinton didn't care about that. He was like, wag the dog kind of situation, created distraction for the public. Why George Bush Jr. did the second war may be explained by a thing called the Project for the Neo-American Century. I, what happened was a group of conservatives in the United States had actually written a series of letters to Bill Clinton beginning in 1998, and then they ended up part of the George Bush Senior or George Bush Jr. government. And those letters said that what the United States ought to do is invade Iraq, conquer it, create it as, turn it into a base of operations, and then either invade Syria or Iran next, conquer those two, because whichever you only didn't do second, you'll do third. Then the United States is going to invade and conquer Saudi Arabia. So the plan was to backstab Saudi Arabia and then invade and conquer Egypt. And in the process, encircle Israel, secure Israel, make it safe, and then change the borders of the region to create even more divisions. And and like I, I've seen the map, it's it's crazy. They were going to split the Hejaz off of Najd and, and make it so that there were at least two states where Saudi Arabia was. Um, they were going to carve Iraq up into three states. They were going to carve Syria up. And the goal was to just make it so that the United States would, would now have an imperial foothold in the Middle East. The United States military named the Middle East CENTCOM as in Central Command. So the United States is in Central Command. The United States is NORTHCOM. It's North Command. The center of the United States is the Middle East. And that, that was the mentality that they brought into that war. Of course, it turned into a disaster in the, in the Iraqi people. Uh, you know, Vietnam, the United States, and, and the United States left humiliated and, and in disgrace. Um, the United States got Vietnam by, by Afghanistan as well. So it, was, it ended up being completely catastrophic for the United States empire in the end. But the loss in life and the loss to the global economy is also catastrophic.